Okay, so um, in this video we work through the material that's in section 6.2 which is concerned with the Bohr model and the Bohr model is an attempt to reconcile um, what was learned by Planck and Einstein with what was known about how atoms were structured. So as we were talking about in the last video, the positions of the lines in the hydrogen atom's emission spectrum are predicted well by the Rydberg equation. There is just a tiny little problem. That equation was formulated to, exp um, to fit experimental data, and it has no theoretical foundation. And the meaning of the numbers that go in here is unclear. So Niels Bohr did something very clever. He took uh, Rutherford's nuclear sort of planetary model of the atom and he applied to it what he had learned from Planck and Einstein to develop a theory or to develop an equation that could explain the line spectrum of um, hydrogen. Now Niels Bohr was pretty young when he did this so he's doing sort of you know very very um, advanced uh, physics about fundamental things concerned with the structure of atoms and the nature of matter at a really quite young age. He may even be younger than many of these guys in this class. And he was messing with stuff that Ernest Rutherford, who was sort of the old man of physics, um, had been doing. In fact, you know, Ernest Rutherford is um, so famous that he's on the money in New Zealand, you know. So when you when they put your face on the money, you know you've made it. So Bohr came up with a model of the hydrogen atom based around three key ideas. He said that the hydrogen atom only has certain allowable energy levels and he calls these stationary states because when the um, atom is in one of these stationary states it neither gains nor loses um, energy. It's just kind of stable. And what those states correspond to is an electron in a fixed stationary circular orbit around the nucleus. And as I alluded to previously, the atom when it's in one of these states doesn't lose or gain energy. So this is kind of a little odd because when electrons move in circles, they normally um, radiate energy. So this is a kind of a little bit controversial. Then he went on to say that an atom changes energy when an electron moves from one stationary state to another and how it does this is either by emitting a photon that is losing energy or absorbing a photon that is gaining energy. So it kind of looks like this. This is the um, a description describing a, a pictorial description of a bunch of emissions of hydrogen. When a electron moves from a orbit or stationary state that it is further away from the uh, nucleus down to the n equals 1 state, that's a big drop in energy, then a photon in the ultraviolet region is emitted. That corresponds to a line in the Lyman spectrum. When a electron moves from a stationary state that is further away from the nucleus to the n equals 2 level, it emits a photon that's not quite as energetic that will now be in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum and that corresponds to a line in the Barmer series. And when a photon falls, uh, when an electron, sorry, falls from a higher energy state down to the n equals 3 level, then a um, photon with a little less energy is emitted corresponding to a photon with a wavelength in the infrared is emitted and this is a line that's in the, the Pashkin series. So um, that's what he, um, you know, Bohr said was going on and if we wanted to go the other way then photons would be being absorbed. So um, Bohr introduced it a naming sort of protocol for these different levels. So these are sometimes referred to as energy levels. So we'll talk about the n equals 1 energy level, the n equals 2 energy level, or the n equals 3 energy level. And sometimes we'll talk about them as being different states. 
because remember the language that was originally used was stationary states and the n equals one level the lowest level is referred to as the ground state because you can't fall any lower than the ground and then everything that is bigger than the ground state is referred to as an excited state now that sometimes causes a little bit of confusion because the n equals 2 level is the first excited state, the n equals 3 level is the second excited state, and so on. So you have to be a little bit careful when they start using the terminology associated with excited states. The other thing to note here is that as we go up in energy, the states get closer and closer and closer together. So the biggest gap between levels is between n equals one and n equals two, then n equals two to n equals three is a smaller spacing, and n equals three to n equals four is smaller again, and so on and so on. So eventually they get very tiny spaces between those um, energy levels and they become what we call a continuum. When we go up to the n equals infinity level, the electron is no longer attached to the atom and the atom has become what we call ionized. That electron has been knocked out of the atom. So what Bohr did was he used the rules that are concerned with how um, charged particles interact with one another. That's called um, Coulomb's law. And then he used the um, laws that are associated with circular motion of, of um, particles. And he devised an equation that gives you the energy of one of these levels in the hydrogen atom. And here it is, it says that the energy of an electron in a um, one of these energy levels in the hydrogen atom is just simply equal to a constant, which is indicated with a little k here, divided by n squared, where n squared is the energy level, which is a whole positive number. Okay. So that's really it. Um, so this K has the value of minus 2.179 by 10 to the minus um, 18 joules. It's often referred to as the Rydberg um, energy. Sometimes K is given um, another symbol. For example, in Alex, I think they give the symbol um, RY for the Rydberg energy. So um, they'll give it that symbol, but it's the same thing. Okay, so here's um, an example problem. It says, what is the energy of an electron in the first excited state of the hydrogen atom? So I've put it in ita italics here to kind of indicate what's going on. It says the first excited state, which is code for n equals two, because n equals one is the ground state. So this is fairly simple. E equals K over N squared. So that's minus 2.179 by 10 to the minus 18 over two squared. So the energy of this electron, and that's gonna be in joules because the Rydberg energy is in joules, ends up being for this particular problem. So I'm gonna to have to grab my calculator here. We've got minus 2.179, second function e to the minus 18 on four, ends up being minus 5.45 by 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, so really that's it. It's not too tricky. We should be able to kind of cope with that. Now what happens when an electron moves from one energy level to another? It absorbs or emits a photon, so we can extend the um, Bohr equation to take that into account. So it's just going to be the energy of the final state minus the energy of the initial state. So I've just pulled um, K out here as the um, as the constant out the front and so then that just becomes one on n squared minus one on n squared uh, one on one n squared final minus one on n squared initial 
It turns out that this gives exactly the same answers as the Rydberg equation, which is really good. A little trick that you'll see that we'll need to do is that if we're asked about the ionization of an atom, that is that we want to completely remove an, an electron from the atom, and then we just set an n squared final to be an infinity squared, and hopefully you recognize that one on infinity squared equals zero. So here's an example of that. It says, what is the longest wavelength? So longest wavelength, we should keep in mind, corresponds to lowest energy. So it's just code for lowest energy of a photon that can ionize. So that means that the n final will be infinity, an electron from the second excited state so that means that n initial is three, okay? So that's kind of, um, that's what's going on there. So let's see uh, what we've got going on here. So what we need to do is E equals K multiplied by one on infinity squared minus one on three squared. Okay, so that's going to be it. And so I am going to put that into my calculator, K being minus 2.179 by 10 to the minus 19. 2.179 by 10 to the minus 18, sorry. Over one on infinity squared being zero, minus one on three squared. So that's going to be one on nine. So that's going to give me an energy in joules and when I do that put that into my calculator I got 2.42 by 10 to the minus 19 joules now that's not what is asked for what was asked for is the wavelength so what I've calculated here is the energy between the n equals 3 level and the n equals infinity level. So that would be the minimum energy that I would have to put into the atom to get it to the n equals infinity level. What I now need to do is recognize that the energy of the photon that needs to be absorbed would have that energy, and that energy can be related to the wavelength of that photon versus the Einstein equation. So that means that hc on e equals lambda. So I can go ahead and calculate that. 6.626 by 10 to the minus 34 times 3 by 10 to the 8. And then I'm just going to put in the number that I had before, 2.42 by 10 to the minus 19. And I'll get a wavelength. So when I do that, the wavelength that I got was 8.21, sorry, by 10 to the minus 7 meters. And if I want, I could convert that to nanometers, but I'm just going to leave it as it is. All right, so that's a fairly tricky question. and. Um, you know, it would take a considerable effort to, to do that. So that would be worth a considerable number of points on your test or quiz. Now, Bohr was able to kind of, he you know, he wanted to do more than just look at um, the hydrogen atom. He wanted to look at every atom in the periodic table. And there's like, you know, 118 atoms in the periodic table. And he wasn't able to extend his work to um, to all of these atoms, but he was able to extend his work to any ion or atom that had one electron. So ions of this type would be things like helium plus, lithium two plus, beryllium three plus, anything that has just one electron. Now, if you're going to do this, you have to take into account that these ions will have more protons in their nucleus than a hydrogen atom. So you have to take into account what we call the nuclear charge, and we're going to do that via the atomic number. So what Bohr found was if you included a term of z squared 
into your energy formula, then this worked for these one electron ions as well. So our revised or more complete version of the Bohr equation includes a multiplier of the atomic number squared and we just get the atomic number from the periodic table. So here we go, it says what is the energy of an electron in the second excited state of a helium atom? So I have to go to the periodic table and find Z for helium and it's pretty easy, it's 2. And then it says the second excited state, so that corresponds to N equals 3. So E equals K, the Rydberg energy, times by Z squared on N squared. And now I am good. So here we are. Let's see what we've got. So we've got 2.179 by 10 to the minus 18, that's minus there, times 2 squared or 4 over 3 squared and so the energy equals and this will be in joules. It's going to be a small number. Let's see what we get here. So it ends up being 9.68 by 10 to the minus 18 joules if I enter that into the calculator correctly. Okay, so we've extended the Bohr model out to other things that have only one electron. Now Bohr kind of kept playing with the math here and he was able to come up with a formula that gave you the radius of one of these orbits for a one electron atom, i.e. that's hydrogen, or a one electron ion and that's going to be things like helium plus lithium 2 plus etc and this is the little formula here it says that the radius of the orbit will be n squared that's the value of the energy level multiplied by a naught which is um, refers to the Bohr radius which is a constant that you would always be able to look up divided by the atomic number so problems of these type tend to be just sort of like um, plug and chug, you just put the um, appropriate numbers into the formula for the radius and you're going to be very fortunate in that your testing and exams this quarter will be open book so that shouldn't cause you too much inconvenience. So let's have a look at this. It says what is the radius of electrons of the elect of the what is the radius of electrons orbit in the first state of the helium plus in the first excited state of the helium plus ion. So first excited state is n equals 2 and then helium plus the reason for us um, being given that is because we need to recognize that z equals 2 and then now we just kind of have to um, go for it so r equals n squared times by a naught on z and then we just have to put it in so n was 2 so that's 2 squared and then a naught is 5.292 times 10 to the minus 11. And then z is 2. So I put that into my calculator and I get a number 1.06 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. And that's reasonable because you might recall way back from uh, chemistry 161, we said that atoms have a radius of around about 10 to the minus 10 meters. So that's not too bad. So that brings section 6.2 to an end and uh, you're ready to begin your assignments for the week. So we have a couple of things going on. We've got some Alex objectives, we've got a lab and we have a quiz that needs completing. Okay, hope you found the video helpful and good luck with everything.